kind of the nexus of where this idea came from was um, probably similar to a lot of the people on the call, like Awana and, and Lohan. Um, when you start talking to people about kind of what you're doing in the identity space, there tends to be quite a large amount of confusion. And especially because coming from an SSI network perspective, we're really not customer facing. Um, and a lot of what we're doing and what we're building is behind the scenes. And yet the way that we have to explain what we're building is by first starting off with say, know your customer checks for banks, which everyone understands. So we kind of create our own uh, worst nightmare and, and create our own uh, our own trap. Um, but obviously first thing to, to kind of cover off is um, you've got myself and Anchor from Checked. Um, so we'll get onto what that is later on, but creating the authentic data economy. And we also have uh, Alina um, on the call from our marketing team as well. Um, but first, um, probably hand over to Anchor so you can uh, welcome the rest of the panel. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I, I thought like as a CEO, maybe you should introduce. Um, We're very excited to have the people uh, who are joining us today. Um, I think the reason for arranging this and the panel that we have is um, really through a whole range of different conversations that I've had with Iwana, Aaron, Lohan in the past, um, how digital identity and the concept of uh, trusted information online has been evolving over the past uh, years, decades, as, as things get more digital. Um, and through all of those different discussions, we, we had some very interesting conversations that came up. Um, and, and I'd love the panelists to be able to get a chance to introduce themselves, but from myself, um, I'm CTO and the co-founder at Checked along with Fraser. I'm quite excited to be able to give our view of how uh, technologies like self-sovereign identity and other forms of trusted data are working together to create a future where um, trusted data can be dealt with differently online. So maybe on that note, uh, can I first go to Iwana if you introduce yourself? Of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invite, Anchor. And you're right, we had numerous discussions around trusted data um, and uh, transparency when it comes to data and digital identity and what can be built on top of that. Um, so I'm Chief Strategy Officer for DIA, uh, which stands for Decentralized Information Asset. Uh, we are a open source financial platform and an Oracle provider. I also, within DIA, uh, run Labs. It's a unit I've created, uh, or um, to be more specific, revamped, um, and where I tackle a couple of angles. Uh, probably the most uh, notable one is the one where I push for um, ecosystem development, and by that I mean in particular to, to us and, and our Oracle provision business, I'm trying to push Oracle provision beyond financial data permutations into gaming and NFTs and digital fashion and all of these other, um, let's just call them cool metaverse components. Um, so yeah, I'll speak later, I'll, I'll give you additional details about what we do and how we provide our Oracles, but I'll uh, leave it to, to the others to introduce themselves. Aaron, over to you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, hi, I'm Aaron van Amras, uh, CTO and founding partner of Outlier Ventures. Um, we uh, run the world's leading open metaverse accelerator, Basecamp. Um, and yeah, I've uh, worked with, uh, with many teams over the years um, uh, looking to, um, well, amongst other things, um, provide trusted data feeds and uh, um, identity solutions that are really important part of, of uh, the metaverse. Um, it's ultimately what's, you know, what things are built on and, and how uh, people can access um, their, their digital or partially digital uh, assets. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. Over to you, Lauren. Me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Luan Spies. Um, I've been uh, in the SSI space now for about five, six years. I'm a founding steward of a sovereign network, as well as one of the, uh, the first validators on the Czech network. And uh, I'm working specifically on a project together with uh, UNICEF and other partners where we actually apply South Zone identity to provide youth in Africa with the ability to build up digital CVs. Um, 
but yeah, I really find kind of a lot of passion in not only discussing the technology, but actually applying it um, on the ground and seeing how what works and what don't work. Excellent. Um, so we'll come back to our panel in a second uh, to talk about their sort of like takes on the various aspects of digital ID and data. Uh, but first, just to set the scene, what do we mean when we say digital identity? Uh, and so Fraser, are you gonna control this, right? Okay, cool. So most people think uh, digital identity, and especially when we've been talking about this ourselves online, um, this is the image that springs to a lot of people's mind. Uh, it's the common sort of like, you know, NASCAR screen of like different logos that you see coming up or uh, on, on sign on. Um, Simon, if you have the question, like please do put it into chat and we can pick, pick that up. Um, so often when we think about digital identity, people ask like, you know, how is it different from say using login with Facebook and login with Apple and so on. Uh, but what it actually is, is if you go on to the next slide, um, what that is actually doing is it's, a, it's an act called authentication. Um, and in a sense, it's looking at like, who are you, which is getting the right sort of like username and password, and what are you allowed to do with it? But if you actually get down to the question, who are you and what does it really prove? So if you go on to the next slide, um, what, what does a Facebook login really prove? Uh, Facebook login just proves that you've got an email address and you've been able to uh, click on that to, to log on online. And there's, there's a pretty famous saying on the internet, it's from a really old New Yorker cartoon, it's like on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And um, the second image is actually from uh, Facebook's developer conference or uh, when they were describing some of the aspects of like Facebook login they were doing. Um, and what's quite interesting, of course, if you saw the news yesterday is uh, all of like, you know, Facebook's infrastructure went down and they had a massive outage. Um, so fundamentally what th that is doing though, is that it's only saying you have a Facebook account and then I'm tying that Facebook account as an easy means of creating a username and a password. But if you go on to the next slide, what we then start like, you know, digging into is like, so if you had to go beyond just the fact that you have a Facebook account, how do you currently prove trustworthiness for a person online to take a simple example? Um, and the, basically it often boils down to uh, send us some pictures, send us some PDF documents, and we'll see if they are trustworthy enough. We'll run our own checks to be able to then correlate that back perhaps to the organizations that issued it or some proxies of those organizations to understand if these documents are trustworthy enough. And if you go on to the next slide, what that brings us to is uh, you then come onto the idea or the concept of identity verification. And so identity verification, which is quite different from the idea of authentication and authorization is who are you really as a person or who are you really as a company? Um, and if you actually extend that out, it could apply to a whole bunch of other different um, non-human actors as well. But when you have the verification idea, uh, it's, it's not just who you, who you are or what username and passwords do you know, uh, but who you really are as a person. And so that brings us to the topic of what is self-sovereign digital identity. And we'll come on to how this ties into the rest in a second. But if you look at self-sovereign digital identity, um, it is what if you had a verified, secure, private and digital copy of your data that you control? Um, and that's a key sort of like operative point here where it, 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 it's quite important that like you need to be able to control whom you share the data with, which parts of that data you share and how is that sort of uh, regulated or how is that sort of like made um, in a fashion where you understand what the consequences of those are rather than it being stored by a specific company like say Facebook. Um, and if you go into the next slide, what that then sort of like, you know, allows us to imagine a vision of is um, the identity checks that are taking place could be done in seconds rather than perhaps say the minutes or days that it takes right now. Um, I, you know, recently opened a bank account and, and it took about like 24 hours just to go through that, take a selfie, take a passport type check. Um, and it's instant, more efficient and more trustworthy in, in like giving control back 
um, as well as making that sort of like digital process itself more secure than perhaps slinging uh, PDF documents around. Fraser, do you want to go through like the next two bits and then um, I can so to describe like what we're doing at Checked? Yeah, absolutely. More than happy to. Um, and this is kind of uh, the, the conversation we've had multiple, multiple times and kind of having to also explain what Anchor's just gone through to try and kind of bring people into kind of the way of thinking about identity and then also take them into how SSI works. Um, but broadly speaking, we're, we're building um, the clear incentive model for the entire SSI ecosystem. But what, what does that mean practically? Um, so what we're building are effectively the payment rails and the commercial models, as well as the base identity capabilities that allow SSI to happen and what we believe make it truly successful. And a lot of the previous networks that have been out, out there, the likes of the sovereigns and even some of the kind of ones that we're starting to see elsewhere, have very much just focused on the decentralized ID capabilities. And there, there really hasn't been a route to um, either monetize or create payments or commercial models around that data in the C in kind of the traditional identity models that Anchor's just spoken about. So your kind of IDMV processes, your KYC process, all have kind of commercial uh, commercials attached to it. And what we're really looking to do is fill that gap for self-sovereign identity um, and pro provide the ability for um, receivers of data to pay issuers of that data, but also reward credential holders as well and the subjects. And the vision that we see here is that by introducing kind of economic incentives, will actually boot, like really accelerate the adoption of the technology. The analogy that we've been, or the parallel that we've used a couple of times is like comparing to the early days of the internet where there was some amazing technical kind of execution and engineering going on, but really the kind of um, the increase in the adoption was driven by the business side, taking a new technology and building out new kind of business models, new commercial structures, um, and entirely new offerings off the back of it. And how we're doing that specifically is um, we've built our, uh, our kind of network on the Cosmos SDK. Um, we've built or we're building out those kind of decentralized ID capabilities, decentralized governance, which you have plenty of materials coming out on, um, but also a kind of dedicated token uh, across this to facilitate exchange. And the vision here is that the, the kind of the base layer allows um, transactional interactions across the world. So for example, if I gave Anchor his data, um, I ha feasibly have no idea where he's going to use it. And therefore we need the ability to receive and issue payments from anywhere globally on a transactional basis. He could go from the UK back to Singapore and we need to be able to maintain kind of payments between, between those organizations seamlessly. But probably the, the bit that we're slight, doing slightly different to a lot of um, other organizations looking at this is looking at ecosystems and creating customizable commercial models for them. So we've had a long and kind of storied history and identity between the two of us. And across each of those ecosystems, they monetize data and identity in different ways. And therefore, what we want to do is provide commercial models which can be customized via both kind of smart contracts and tokenomics so that each ecosystem can create its own incentive model. And we believe that's the best way of making each of these ecosystems properly successful. So now it's back over to Anchor to kind of cover off um, how SSI actually complements kind of um, the other kind of movements or industries or use cases of data um, and how that also interacts with kind of the work that uh, Lohan, Awana and, uh, and Aaron have been up to. Thanks. Um, so we, we the 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 reason why we sort of like you know the and the angle on the panel discussion is um, how do all of these different ecosystems of uh, Web three point projects link together? And so, for example, as an example, when you take the first concept that you heard of, like which is authentication, uh, many of you might have heard of something called Magic Dot Link, uh, which is a company that raised uh, some amount of funding recently, or the Ethereum naming service. Uh, because those are effectively just giving a username and a password, how do you know the person behind that? If you combine, say, digital credentials that you can carry out and have been verified to a certain degree, then uh, what you can effectively say, you could have like one click onboarding, uh, which you don't ever have to fill out a form ever again, because you can do the sign on and the authentication and the check that you carry out in, in one go. If you then go on to looking at the next one, um, 
you know, NFTs are a big topic uh, right now. So when you think of like non-fungible tokens, um, one of the aspects of that you need to bear in mind is how do you understand it came from the real artist or how do you understand certain like aspects of authentic authenticity about that uh, data itself. So uh, from the from the point of like a digital artwork, if you, you if you could combine a token which represents a digital along with credentials that come along with it about the artwork itself, uh, it creates a more compelling and perhaps a more verified experience. If we move on to uh, trusted oracles, and I do want to talk to Ivana about this. So oracles obviously are giving us data feeds about what is happening in the real world and like bridging that gap to blockchain applications. Um, how can you then perhaps create like certified snapshots at a point in time of what happened in the real world, um, which can be tackled in, in multiple ways. Uh, but there's aspects of that, you know, which could be put into a credential that says it's a certified snapshot. Um, if you go on to the next slide, then the other sort of angle here is let's, the other question we get asked is how is this different from say a decentralized storage format like um, IPFS, Definity or Solid? Um, and, the, and the analogy that I use there is like, you know, IPFS is probably where you, or any of these decentralized storage mechanisms is often where you can store personal data. For instance, you might be able to store the Zoom recording, you might be able to store large files, you might be able to store picture collections, um, but they're often for larger file size data that you need to just read around, perhaps of low assurance, um, and you can have higher level of assurance data on a credential. And what can be quite compelling perhaps is to go back to that idea of how you have a single click authentication and the person behind it. You can also then go and look at how can you use digital credentials to give access to uh, decentralized storage and, and what that sort of like means in terms of making online experiences uh, more seamless and secure. And then if you go on to, I believe this is the last one. Um, the, the other one that comes up is often things like decentralized ad networks. And actually, Lohan, I want to talk to you about this one. So um, if you have heard of the idea of a basic attention token, which is from the Brave Browser team, um, that is about like you know, connecting uh, vast levels of behavioral data. So it's still personal data, but it's um, often observed information or it's observed or inferred data about someone. Um, and the 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 Point there, of course, is that like, you know, I mean, it, it could be used to run ad networks or like how ad networks currently work is they um, collect a lot of your data. You don't really have a lot of control on where they end up going and how it's used. Um, but the lower level sort of like behavioral data doesn't necessarily prove that I'm Anka Banerjee or that I'm person X. Um, and that's where um, in terms of how there are a lot of like technologies that are working towards decentralization of behavioral data um, can have a step up mechanism when you get to, when you need a higher level of assurance, let's say you're opening up a bank account or traveling um, where the digital credentials or SSI credentials come in, um, while the, the technologies that provide the decentralization of behavioral data can help with the lower level assurance data that is that is often collected about us online. So that brings us to the panel discussion. And uh, what I'd love to do is, uh, Aaron, if I can go to you first and okay. get your sort of like thoughts on, um, you know, you've obviously in Outlier Ventures, you see a lot of like different projects come through, a lot of different startups um, working in the crypto space. Um, and identity is often a key component of them. So what are the sort of like disruptive things uh, that you've seen happening in the industry as well as the challenges? Right. Yeah, so indeed, we, like, we, we work with a lot of um, um, teams building different types of things in this space. So we you know, see them from quite a, a lot of angles. Um, I would say um, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see how much is uh, already possible and being executed on with uh, quite a limited amount. Because if you look at the, the NFT boom, as we've seen it, maybe you know start from the beginning of this year to now, you know there's there's lots of 
um, uh, the crypto punks and board apes and, and all of these things suddenly becoming uh, very valuable and and being used in you know not just people uh, buying and holding them and and, and showing them used as uh, as methods of access to uh, communities like you have things like okay uh, token gated discord you must hold uh, a board ape if you want to uh, to come in here or you must hold a board ape and, and a crypto punk right and only then can you can you access that and um like that's that's built on just the fundamentals of having an unfungible token uh with you know some metadata and and some some visual data that's that's can be somewhere on a decentralized network um you know which is great but which which has none of these capabilities as as you described it yet um so uh, like these primitives of uh, you can have much more uh, fine-grained and sophisticated credentials. Um, they can be uh, um, attested to by by uh, various organizations or individuals or things like you know, uh, like I said, the, the, the verified creator. Like we, uh, it's a much more firm um um proof that you know this nft was actually created by this this famous artist or maybe you know this this collective of, of artists um uh like imagine what becomes possible then right um uh, and um and ultimately also the the incentivization model around that now you know with with, with nfts you see okay there's you know that there, there's value flows and people are creating tokens and those kind of things um but um, like the incentivization models that that you guys are building and, and facilitating at checked at, at um, you know uh, having different models around. Okay, I, w I want to I want to be an attester, right? I, I I want to play that role to to say uh, to be this trusted party to say that that creator is indeed uh, who they are, or um, no, you know I, I'm I'm actually more in the business of, of of holding people's data or those kind of things, and then having. Uh, crucially that economic model around that um yeah i think that, that that's super exciting too what we'll see uh yeah expand uh the 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 current um which you know already quite uh yeah very exciting world of, of nfts as it currently is um expand far wider with you know all of these additional capabilities yeah, no, that's really sort of uh, interesting to understand. Have you actually done that? Uh, used a board ape to get onto a Discord channel? Do you think I can afford a board ape? Well, <laughs> I don't know if you had early yeah. special access to anything. <laughs> yeah. No, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've seen of those some of those things in uh, in YouTube, but yeah. uh, I don't engage in them in, in, on a daily basis because you know it's 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 a full time job to just you know move around in the NFT world uh, <laughs> alone, let alone uh, being a CTO yeah. and working with any startups at one time. So yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, Lohan, maybe if I can ask you next, like, um, and by the way, for the speakers, do feel free to uh, jump in or like, you know, add on any of the points. Um, Lohan, I think you've, you've, I think I love the story behind what like, you know, Didex and Yoma are doing. Uh, we, we obviously had like a very long conversation. You've spent a lot of time within the cell sovereign identity industry. And um, I think one of the things that really stuck with me from what you said is the, the, the language perhaps even um of like how it's described as self sovereign id um so what's been sort of your experience working you know uh building building out this uh, giving giving youth like you know credentials to be able to find work and like how you found like the language and the concept itself like what has been your sort of uh experience on where the ssi industry or trusted data has been working so um it's quite interesting because initially self sovereign identity, we started off with um, focusing heavily on the technical aspects. And for quite a while, um, it was actually very complicated just to get your head around it and technically start to get anything going. Um, and I think we crossed the bridge now where there are a lot of companies and open source components that allow you to actually start utilizing the notion of SSI um fairly easily like check the intrinsic and even and there are quite a lot of them actually today that you can just go and use and you call an api and you can start using this technology to do whatever you, you want from a use case perspective 
but when he, when we when it comes to Yoma, we basically are trying to solve a very specific um, need within the African um, youth context. We we have a lot of youth on the African continent um, that ultimately don't necessarily have the ability to get access to formal education or any type of education in some cases. And if you look at what COVID did um, to the African youth, uh, for instance, in South Africa, we currently sit with around 74%, this article I read the other day, youth unemployment. It is absolutely, it's, it's kind of, you, you can't really build an economy when you have 74% of your future uh, kind of GDP contributors not being active in the economy. So what we are trying to solve is really to provide the youth um, the ability to, without any friction, um, create, the, create their own self sovereign identity, log into the Yoma platform, and then start participating in these learning opportunities. And then as they participate and they complete the different learning opportunities, they get verifiable credentials to build up a digital CV. We call it alternative digital CV. And then subsequently how that digital CV can then help them to unlock earning potential. Um, and that can be any type of employment. It can be formal employment. It can be any type, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But what it really shows is that we can utilize these Web3 technologies in real world scenarios um, at fairly big scale already. We have already like 40,000 youth on the platform. Um, but it just shows you that we can utilize these digital technologies to really make a major impact and a difference to people that currently or previously never had the ability to do so. And for me, I'm highly passionate about projects like that because it is not just talking about the technology, but really implementing it and seeing what difference it, it can make. Um, sure, we still have a long road to go. Um, and there is still a lot of misconception around understanding blockchain, understanding decentralization, what it really means. But I think what we've proven with Yoma is that you can actually abstract all that complexity and just give something to the people that works. And you can worry about all the complexities at a later stage where traditionally when I started with SSI, I was very highly focused on the principles. It must work in uh, uh, the SSI way and there's no other way. Um, and subsequently, I realized, you know what, it's going to be a stepping stone process. We can't just go from the old world to the new world. We're going to do slowly but surely step in the, in the direction of being truly self-sovereign. Um, but for me, uh, I, I really think that there are an enormous amount of potential that uh, verifiable credentials and SSI can provide. And there are a lot of use cases that are not related to KYC or formal verification that are effectively low friction that can unlock an enormous amount of value. Um, so yeah, that's been our experience and it's been an, in, it's been an exciting journey. Still a, a long way to go, but at least we, we're making a lot of headway and traction. Yeah, no, it's exciting to, to follow that journey as well and to actually know that there's uh, 40,000 people online. That's, that's fantastic. Fraser. Uh, just, uh, I think Lohan touched on something that just resonated with me really at the end of what you're saying, Leon. Like, and also congrats on the numbers because that's incredible to hear. Um, but it was around kind of like very much focused on CVs and moving onto a use case rather than like, like you said at the end, abstracting all the way the mess underneath. Um, and I think that's like, that's something that I think we're trying to do and figure out the best language because like identity as an industry, like even outside of SSI has this really long history of just using like convoluted terms, detailed terminology and losing people. Like I've spent two or three years like in that space. And I remember speaking to so, so many people where like authentication, verification and authorization just lose people almost instantly. Whereas if you start, if you kind of bring it up onto like, what are you actually solving for, like yourselves in CVs, then suddenly, like everyone gets it, it's a lot easier. Um, so I think that's one of the main things for me is just yeah, trying to move to like a better terminology that actually people understand. Because transparently, my mum still has no idea what I'm building, because I can't find the right words to like explain it to her. And it should be easier. And we just need to find that language and also kind of go through that um, process of like how change happens of like explaining the concept to the next group of people who can then bring it eventually down to the mass. Um, so yeah, there was just one bit from, from your explanation that really kind of resonated with me and has been a yeah, massive headache for me so far. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to make a comment on that. Um, and I think the terminology is definitely something that is quite difficult to understand. I mean, for all of us, SSI and VCs and all that stuff is kind of second language. We, we understand it. But I think for me, um, one of the things in the in the self sovereign identity world, which people kind of look into, and it's like a, sh a showstopper, is a lot of the times we think that you know what you need to do KYC before you can do anything with self sovereign identity. And I think for me, the reality is that is um, the more I work in it, the more it becomes true that that's not the case. I think people should stop focusing purely on this highly friction. Um, form of identity proofing and verification before you can unlock value and rather focus on the use case and just start building. Um, and then at some point you will identify, okay, now I need to have like a formal form of identity verification and then you solve the problem. Don't try and solve that first before you actually start doing anything. And I completely agree. I think the, the best parallel that I've got to that is like, I went through the mortgage process recently and every so, like every couple of years, someone comes along saying, we're gonna reinvent the mortgage process and we're gonna make it smoother. And my journey was like, my process was horrendous, but I'd still go to back to that same bank if they were offering me the interest rate that they did. And literally it all came down to like, even if someone solves the speed and the onboarding thing, it's really not gonna change the conversion because it was never about that journey. And I think to your point around KYC, like it's probably the easiest explanation people can give on like how SSI could change stuff. But in terms of the actual value, like I just me or did we lose him? We lost him. We did lose him. Uh, okay, um, probably a good point to come to you, Iwana. Actually, I know I'm apologies. I like, did it on didn't, purpose. Uh, <laughs> didn't didn't get to <laughs> you engineered it somehow. Um, I do want to talk to you about oracles, but I think uh, this is an interesting sort of like you know, given the question as well, like how how does this kind of like space find legitimacy? Um, I think it's quite interesting given your background, how you worked in the reg space, you've worked in the traditional industry, and now moved on to working in the blockchain space. Um, where do you see the drivers for regulation perhaps in this as well that come in, both, both say on what Dear Data is doing and everything else that's happening in Web 3.0? For where do I see the drive, just to clarify, where do I see the drive as for regulation on oracles or digital identity? Because on oracles, I don't see any drivers for regulation and I hope it stays like that. On the, on the <laughs> contrary, if we could deploy our tools to yeah. help the regulators assess um, on-chain activity or particular uh, price, yeah. right? Because of our business model. But yeah, just to clarify your question, which was it? Where do I see regulatory intervention? Um, to or, both, I think. Like, so I think uh, use, uh, regulators using oracles to monitor on-chain activity is an interesting angle and um, would be interesting if you've seen that sort of like moving it in that direction. Um, but also like, given sort of your background and expertise, like where do you see regulation sort of like moving the space on digital identity in, in crypto, in blockchain systems, on these online communities? Um, so yeah, uh, I guess both angles actually. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And just to take a step back and to exemplify regarding our business model and what we do and how we tackle the Oracle problem. So um, I guess everyone on the call uh, knows that smart contracts are confined to executing in a closed environment and in a closed network. And they rely on, to do that, they rely on data existing on that network or data that is being fed into that blockchain. And this is where oracles come in because they are that bridge service whereby you, access, you, you give the smart contract access to off-chain data. Um, because, um, DeFi applications are getting increasingly um, dependent on, on a perfect or close to perfect Oracle provision model. Um, it is very important to build the Oracle in a, in a particular fashion. And there are a couple of uh, Oracle providers in the market. Obviously, we're not the only ones, but we have chosen a particular path, which is that of uh, leveraging the wisdom of the crowd and, and offering full transparency. 
um, into our data and how we arrive to, to an endpoint and how we search it and validate it, et cetera. So um, how we operate, we have, we have access to granular trade level data from sexes and de dexes. Uh, we pull it in, pro, uh, perform some, some uh, filtering and propri proprietary methodology on it, then push it into our API. And from there, it gets oracleized and pushed back on chain for on-chain applications or via the API pushed into off-chain applications. So we have chosen a particular, let's just say we have a differentiating angle in the market because we use the crowd to source and validate data because first of all, we believe it's much more efficient. We rely on the versatility of the crowd um, and, and the wisdom uh, of the crowd. And we provide transparency into our whole process. So from sourcing to validations, uh, validation, you see the methodologies that have been deployed up to the um, end point or end price of an asset, for instance. And this is why I said that it's extremely interesting for regulators um, because they will, for instance, have access to, they, they will have um, access to the source, to, to identifying the sources that were used to calculate a particular price point. And if you look at our other Oracle providers in the market, no one really does that. Um, and we have chosen this particular approach because we believe that trusted data uh, is transparency, represents transparency into the process of, of how you've actually sourced and manipulated, manipulated not in a nefarious sense, manipulated that, that data to, um, to reach a, a certain endpoint, right? Um, and I think, you know, looking into the future, and I'm surprised Aaron didn't touch on the metaverse. So if we think of a metaverse as the base layer powered base layer interface uh, between the, the analog and digital worlds and uh, a world that is powered by DAOs, um, we are we at the uh, we are DAO ourselves. That's why we're called the association. Uh, for that, you need a huge um, reput decentralized reputation uh, system powered by SSI, right? So you need to to deploy SSI, create this reputation system to to enable the correct functioning of a DAO. Um, so this is where I see the SSI angle within decentralized organizations, which we are um, as well. And to go back to, to your original question, regulators are um, behaving sometimes in a fickle fashion. Why? Because for instance, for digital ID, they're now analyzing, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're aware. So they are now analyzing the EIDAS regulation or directive in conjunction with specific SSI related elements. So they're looking at how to generate a sort of symbiosis between uh, decentralized identifiers and, and verifiable credentials um, and uh, kind of insert them into, into the architecture of the EIDAS, um, of architecture of EIDAS. And I think that's encouraging. However, you don't see that happening for DeFi. So you don't see anyone, any financial regulator looking at how you can use decentralized settlement um, in traditional finance. So um, I think, Digital ID is a good niche uh, to create that symbiosis or, or to, to generate acceptance for, from the regulatory side onto the wider uh, DeFi ecosystem because uh, digital identity is a prerequisite for, for DeFi to, to develop even further, right? It can even change uh, based on how you provide a digital identity solution. Um, so they are watching, I think it's encouraging to see that they're willing to get involved uh, in the digital identity space. And we, all of us in DeFi are hoping to capitalize on that um, and yeah, uh, get them involved in, in other angles. Um, so yeah, this is it uh, on, on my side. I hope it, it answers your regulatory question. Pretty well, actually. And actually what I find interesting there is um, I love the fact that you're working on the transparency and the explainability. That's obviously the key thing that you get through a lot of these decentralized systems. Um, I, I love the, like, I, I think there's, there's been a lot of studies on like the wisdom of the crowds and how, can, how that can often be a lot more accurate. Um, what I find quite interesting with the wisdom of the crowds and the DAO concept is um, how do you, how do you sort of, protect your DAO or how do you protect your crowd-based system from uh, being gamed by different actors who, who might, for instance, like create, say, loads of different fake accounts to put in, like, you know, different signals 
not necessarily, I guess, a question about like Dia data itself or the or the practice, but um, it is an interesting challenge. So I, I'd love to get like you know thoughts from maybe you, Ruana first, and Aaron as well, because uh, it is an interesting thing to look at. Like how how do you uh, how do you not make it like so that everybody has to KYC when they come to a DAO? I think like there's very high friction. Uh, I think it sort of like removes a lot of the privacy and the anonymity or the pseudonymity that is useful in this space. But um, so yeah, no, what are your thoughts on that? Like how perhaps have you tackled or thought about this problem? I like how you asked the question where the answer would be the solution you're offering for SSI, right? So- it Doesn't have <laughs> exactly. to be. <laughs> SSI preserves anonymity. You can build a reputation system around it. Um, so first of all, just to, to say that I believe, uh, talking about gaming, again, I, I don't use gaming uh, in a context that has nefarious elements in it. I actually believe DeFi is gamified finance. Uh, and I'm not the one to have come up with that. I've heard it in a couple of um, contexts and I, I've, I've taken it on because I really do believe DeFi is just that. Um, but how do you protect your crowd wisdom? Uh, first of all, you need to have the correct uh, incentive system to enable that, like the right type of crowd is attracted to by to your project and they are incentivized, correctly incentivized to partake in it and, and to help, help the development of, of that project in a way that is consistent with what you had in mind as a founder. Um, but how do you actually protect it from, uh, I don't know, bots uh, all of a sudden voting, um, right, in governance related issue or product related issue, digital identity. <laughs> That's why I said you, you formulated the question in a way that the only answer that I could give is this. So self sovereign identity, which preserves anonymity and ensures security via which you can build and I go back to my earlier point of uh, a very stable decentralized reputation system. And this is how you can ensure, let's, so I think of DAOs as a corporation, right? It's just like a digital uh, type of corporation where you have network effects and, and uh, different coordination mechanisms, but they're still coordination mechanisms. So as a DAO, you need to hire or ensure that the best talent takes part, uh, takes part in voting on your product and governance, um, et cetera, and, and your development path. So in order to do that, you need to track the reputation of the entities that you want involved uh, in your DAO somehow. How do you do that? Reputation system. How do you build it with a very solid SSI um, solution? Of course, this is not going to happen in a month or two. It takes time. Um, I, I know that there are many projects in the market to have tried that. It takes time to build the infrastructure. It takes time to build interoperability and um, interconnectedness between various DAOs and, and various reputation systems, because I don't believe there's only going to be one. Uh, but yeah, this is how, this is the only tool that we have at disposal, I guess, to ensure that a DAO functions uh, the way we would want it to. And we are set up as a DAO. We're moving towards full decentralization. Um, so obviously we're very carefully looking at that uh, reputation system and how we can enable it and how we can deploy it to, um, to ours and the community's advantage. It must be quite a challenge to handle reputation within your own, like the actors who are building stuff when you move to a more decentralized and a DAO model as well, right? Not, not just the crowd, but like even, even your own sort of contributors and employees, as you said, it's a communication challenge and coordination challenge. Exactly. Yeah, Aaron, um, have you got like any any sort of like you know comments on the like the DAO angle? I think it's quite interesting how a lo lot of these are moving towards reputation systems of some kind. Um, I mean, to yeah. be fair, actually, I have seen reputation systems that are non-SSI as well. So I will hold my hand up and say <laughs> that's not <laughs> the only answer. Um, but uh, what 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 have you seen in the market as well on like different approaches that have been taken out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, um, I think 2021 is not only the year of NFTs and, and metaverse, like the, it's also the year where DAOs have gone from being kind of obscure to being at least crypto mainstream. I wouldn't say mainstream mainstream, but almost every, um, uh, no, not almost every, but many uh, crypto uh, tokenized protocols, including DIA, but including like most of the DeFi protocols, have some form of a DAO 
I'm saying some form because ultimately, if you have you know uh, uh, token holders and you have a snapshot page um, and you have uh, some kind of a, of a treasury, there can be votes, there can be actions, and that's it, right? You have a DAO, you have the minimum viable DAO, um, um, but you have much more, you know. DAO tools like like uh, tool stacks like DAO, DAO stack and uh, Aragon and and uh, a few others that have come through over the year. We're offer you know much more sophisticated tooling, but ultimately the basis is that like you have a group of entities. Um, they're not necessarily legally known entities, uh, but they can participate through you know these these mechanisms. Now. Um, that's all, all fine and good. And, you know, my background is not uh, uh, regulatory or legal or all of those kinds of things, but in this, this space, you know, you, you tend to do those subjects. Um, and now what would I see uh, that's happening with, with uh, from that perspective um, is, uh, well, in, in DeFi, there's experimentation around financial instruments. And then, you know, it, it goes very fast. Innovation like moves at at a blazing speed, and then at some point the regulator comes in and is like, "Hmm, what does this look like?" Okay, um, I look in my book. It looks mostly like this, so I'm gonna you know I'm gonna classify it as such, and it has these 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 requirements, which of course go around classification as security or as a money transmitter or as an investment instrument and those kind of things. So things tend tend to be. Um, well, they, they, they try to fit it in. I'm saying they, I'm not definitely a part of it. But try to fit it in what what they know, um, and the the same is happening with with DAOs. Like people are in um, uh, organizational structures or collaboration structures, which you know, of course, they always have uh, some some resemblance and some footing in what's uh, what's traditionally been known. Um, but they also have genuinely new things. And, you know, again, regulators come in and they're like, well, mm, actually this looks like an investment partnership or this looks like uh, whatever, you know, existing form. Um, and um, uh, I, I guess, you know, we, we, we need, uh, I, I would like to see a lot more collaboration with, uh, with uh, regulators to, to make that a bit you know, to, to also ha help, you know, let us help them, us, the, the, the crypto space, us, the, the Web3 space, to to sh see what's possible. I would even know, I, I'm waiting for the day that um, somebody uh, tries to, you know, create uh, a protocol or a DAO that um, tries to achieve the, the goals of regulation, um, but with the new tools, because people, you know, what happens is this, we're in the crypto space, we see, ah, but, you know, regulate is bad because old fashioned and we have zero knowledge proofs, we can solve it better. Well, do it, you know, let somebody solve it better, show how it can be done and, and you know, show to, to regulate, okay, this is how you could do it while preserving every, everybody's um, uh, private uh, private data, not obliging everybody to send PDFs around that end up in, in treasure troves of information and those kind of things. And yeah, no, it doesn't match the, the, the law as it currently is because the law says you have to, you know, send a fax to this person, you have to keep this paper and we don't have paper because we have, you know, we have blockchains and we have <laughs> cryptographic proofs and those kind of things. But um, uh, at least, you know, you can, can show what's, uh, what's possible. Oh, and I actually one, lost. Uh, um, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry yes, sir. yeah. Now on um, uh, like the the participation aspect that uh, you wanted you briefly to mention, and, and I'm curious as well. Um, uh, there's I, I'm seeing lots of experimentation around that as well, where um, uh, like inside DAOs, you need a certain level of participation in say the Discord or the the, the, the forum or commits to the GitHub to be um uh, to be eligible to to participate in governance um or to so, sort of keep you can you know you can get your DAO tokens uh, but you need to do certain things to to keep them or keep them active um and yeah that again is quite quite nice and and not uh i guess not something that that's uh, that you could find in more traditional uh forms of of governance and um, yeah, I'm quite excited to, to see that or uh, further develop things like source cred, which is you now a, a tool set to, to grasp that kind of online activity and uh, then, then translate that to, um, to voting power. Yeah, I'm quite uh, excited about that.
I think it's quite compelling, actually, that point that both uh, Aaron Iwana, you touched on. Um, like, a lot of this sort of reputational staking has often been just based on financial stake. And now it's quite interesting that there are I mean, reputation as well, or, or some form of reputation that uh, is perhaps, you know, you, you don't need to have the, the, the financial uh, money to buy the stake and you can earn it in different ways. Um, I'm conscious of like the question that Dari has asked, by the way. Um, so Lohan, um, quite an interesting sort of like, you know, angle, I think like, uh, given the space you've been working in, like, you know, it's, it's an interesting topic. Like, how do you have credentials in different languages? I don't know if that's a challenge you've faced before. And I guess more broadly, like it, it works towards that sort of like, uh, look towards legitimacy with institutions. So, uh, yeah, having been in this space, would love to hear your thoughts on, on both of those. Yeah, so when it comes to the um, the ecosystem that we are building, we're definitely facing language problems because we what our objective is to localize the platform to every single country that want to localize it. So at the moment, we're already working with French, English. Um, we have about five other languages that is on the table that we need to translate the platform into. And what we do at the moment is, um, when it's in a French-speaking country, we just issue the credentials in French. But it's a very valid point that, that's being raised here. And I think what, what the natural progression for us would be to generalize the language. We might most probably issue all the credentials in English and then another one in a different language in French. And then when you do the proofs, you can just ask, you know what, I want to see this in English or I want to see this in French. Um, but from a, from a data format perspective, nothing changes. Um, the only thing that really changes is the content to the different languages. So either you can issue the credential in one universal language and then one in a localized language, or like I mentioned, you need to basically take a language and then translate it yourself. But of course, sometimes you might miss some of the information. Um, like Google Translate, don't translate 100%. It just gives you a, a fairly good version of a translated credential. But that is how, how we are solving the problem. Um, but it's definitely something that we will solve in uh, more elegantly as we go forward, because the, the platform will be localized into many, many different countries in the future. Excellent. And uh, I guess on the legitimacy, like, have you uh, very quick thoughts on how you found, uh, I guess, portraying the legitimacy of these credentials to, uh, I guess, more traditional institutions? Um, so from our perspective, uh, the legitimacy of our credentials is really only um, at this stage valid within our own ecosystem. We don't cross connect between different ecosystems. So we act as the trust authority for the whole ecosystem and all the credentials that are issued within the ecosystem. And we vet and validate all the people that will come in as issuers. Um, but I think from a legitimacy perspective, at some point you will need to have a notion of machine readable governance where that can prove that certain um, issuers are actually vetted and validated. And then of course, um, working on the reputation of those um, institutions so that when you want to prove something, you can actually go and say, hey, you know what, to ensure the, the legitimacy of this credential, I want a credential that is, that's issued by a certain institution so there are ways in the in the SSI stack or the SSI technology that you can at least enforce legitimacy to a degree. Um, but once again, it's going to come down to the trust ecosystem or trust ecosystems and what legitimacy and what controls and risk mitigations you want to apply. Um, I think that the legitimacy on, legitimacy on a global basis is really going to start forming once you start having credentials that are really cross-border um, um, usable. At this stage, the closest that we have to that is COVID, and um, it's still in its early phases. Um, but that's how we effectively um, tackle that problem, is that we control and verify and validate who are legitimate and not legitimate in our ecosystem. That makes sense. And, uh, and ultimately, I guess that comes back to the, uh, I guess, the reputation of the person vouching for it that, that you're talking about. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I know we are pretty much close to the end. Um, uh, Ivana, any sort of final thoughts from yourself? I'll go around the panel. Um, what stood out for you? Anything that you want to mention? Uh, everything stood out for me. I, I like the conversation. So uh, to go back to my earlier point, um, if we look at the future, 
uh, as a DigiFizy interface, right? Like similar to the to the way we look at the metaverse today, I think it will evolve into something else uh, in time. And we believe that this new user-centric open economic system will be powered by DAOs, then we need to move away from what Aaron was mentioning, a minimum viable DAO into uh, a format that will allow DAOs to compete with centralized corporations. Uh, we have various coordination mechanisms. We mentioned forums and Telegram and, and Discord channels. They're not enough currently. They're not enough currently to generate, you know, coupled with the incentive mechanisms and network effects, they're not enough to generate direct and, and serious competition for uh, analog corporations. In order to, to lift DAOs and DAOs and para DAOs to, to that level, we need to have a strong reputation system. Uh, and I believe that that strong reputation system will, build, will be built on a couple of digital identity solutions, uh, self-sovereign or, or other. So this is, um, these are my, my final thoughts to be continued in terms of discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you We'd for love the to webinar. chat with you more about that as well. Um, Aaron, Lohan, Aaron, do you want to go next and then? Yeah, maybe... sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, just one um, closing thought, I guess. We, 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 you know, we spoke about uh, a bunch of things that are being built, not, you know, ready tomorrow or, or in a week. Um, but I think, um, uh, and, and that, you know, could paint a picture of, well, when can we finally have it? Um, uh, but I think we should also not underestimate the uh, the capability of you know composability and 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 step by step um, uh, interoperability that these these primitives can make possible. So, for example, oh, you mentioned okay, we have our forty five k people signed up with their credentials, and currently we're using it internally. Um, great, you know. Um, at some point, there will be uh, hopefully some some uh, uh, because you will already have it in a format that's in a data format that's uh, at least in principle, you know, extractable and to use in other countries or other uh, uh, virtual environments or other uh, blockchain ecosystems. And um, the same for for Dia, like you're you're or, uh, you started to be available on one network and then on another one and then on another one um, and. Ultimately, I see the open metaverse as, as one thing that is composed of all these things. And that is composed of also the traditional uh, platforms because you know uh, it's a good day to, to talk about uh, uh, digital identity and authentication uh, after uh, the day after Facebook went down. Um, but you know, the moment uh, Facebook embraces just one of these technologies, um, that's, that's a step ahead, right? Um, because from one, there's two, and from two, there's three. And uh, you know more of more th these systems can uh, can become one and can become more uh, more open. So yeah, those are my final thoughts. Thanks. No oh, excellent uh, point on the composability, and I guess the speed at which the this industry moves sometimes is is uh, quite yeah it's quite massive, and the improvements happen. Um, Lohan, last uh, I guess thoughts from you, and then uh, we can wrap up and say thanks to all the panelists. Yeah, so I think something that definitely stood out for me and uh, a topic that I'm very interested in is the notion of decentralized reputation. And I think it unlocks an enormous amount of potential because if you just take um, reputation on any platform, Facebook, let's take eBay specifically, a lot of the times you'll only go and buy something from someone who at least sold something before. Um, the more they sold, the more you trust them. But the problem with a lot of these reputation systems today is that they are centralized. You can't take your reputation from eBay and go and utilize it in Facebook Marketplace. You can't use your reputation in another Twitter platform and use it in another marketplace. And I think once you start having the ability to actually own that reputation, um, it will unlock an enormous amount of value because then you can start utilizing it across the board. So what I would really like to see forward is that um, all these different decentralized platforms, DeFi, et cetera, exchanges, any, anywhere where you have some form of interaction with your identity, that you can take snippets of reputation out and you build it on your side and then repurpose that whenever you feel you need it. And the nice thing would be that you can then, from a reputation perspective, you don't need to disclose it all, depending on what you want to do. If you want to do a, like a high value transaction, you inject more reputation. If you want to do something anonymous, you inject no reputation. 
So for me, I think reputation is definitely going to be one of those golden threads um, that are really going to unlock a lot of value in this whole ecosystem of SSI and DeFi and Web3 in future.